To discuss what's happening in the world of AI, I'm joined by a very special guest today, Professor Stuart Russell, one of the biggest voices from the world of AI. Professor Russell, what a pleasure to have you with us on Tech Today. It's nice to be with you. Professor, I want to start off by asking you about this open letter to halt, well, the development of tools like ChatGPT or even smarter tools than ChatGPT and to really develop guardrails and safeguards and safety protocols surrounding these tools. I want to actually refer to a part of the letter which says recent months have seen AI labs locked in an out of control race to develop and deploy ever more powerful digital minds that no one, not even their creators, can understand, predict or reliably control. Now there's thousands of signatories to this particular letter. You included Elon Musk, Steve Wozniak. There's a bunch of tech luminaries on that signatory list. But I want to understand from you, what was the rationale? What really prompted you to sign this open letter? We're calling for a halt on the deployment of large language models that are more powerful than the ones that have already been released. Um, and the reason is pretty simple. Uh, as as letter says, we do not understand how these systems work. So just for your listeners and viewers, uh, what is a large language model? It's a, it's a computer program that predicts the next word given a sequence of preceding words. Uh, and with that system, you can have a conversation because when you say something, that forms a sequence of words and then the program responds by saying whatever is the most natural thing to say next. So, um, you know, if I say happy, you might say birthday uh, and that would be a natural prediction for what the next word might be. Um, so the way these systems are built, first of all, uh, there's a very large amount of training data. So basically lots of sequences of words that are collected from various digital resources. Uh, in the case of GPT-4, we think somewhere in the 20 to 30 trillion words of text, which is approximately the same amount as in all the books that the human race has ever written. Um, and then we start from uh, what you might think of as a blank slate, an enormous uh, circuit with about a trillion parameters or more um, and then by the process of doing about a billion trillion small random permutations to those parameters, the system is gradually uh, improved in its ability to predict the next word. So the result of that is something that when you converse with it uh, has many of the appearances of uh, a really intelligent entity. Um, and I've talked to friends who are very sophisticated AI researchers who can't escape the impression that they're actually talking with a real mind. Um, are they talking with a real mind? I mean, interestingly, most people, when you look at how the algorithm works, the training process, you think, okay, it's just going to learn to um, essentially mix and match lots of conversations that are in the training data and then use that to come up with the response to the present one. So it's sort of somewhere between an intelligent piece of paper uh, and a parrot um, and maybe something a little bit more intelligent than that. Um, but when you ask it, for example, um, you know, I've forgotten such and such a mathematical proof. Uh, could you give me that mathematical proof, but give it to me in the form of a Shakespeare sonnet? Uh, and it will write a Shakespeare sonnet that contains within it, you know, a detailed mathematical proof. Um, this is probably not something that's in the training set uh, or anything close to that. So uh, how it manages to do this, we haven't the faintest idea. So I'll say that again. We haven't the faintest idea. Um, do these systems learn their own internal goal structures, right? From all these humans who are, who are writing and speaking, they all have goals. They all have purposes in producing that text. Uh, so it would make sense that the training process would create goals inside the, the computer program. Do they have their own goals? We haven't the faintest idea. 
how do we get them to behave themselves? How do we get them to stop saying bad words? How do we get them not to give you advice mm -hmm. on killing yourself? How do we get them to not give mm -hmm. you advice on building chemical weapons? Well, the only way mm -hmm. we have of doing that is when they do it, we say bad dog. And we hope that they understand what bad dog means uh, and they stop doing it. But they don't. They keep doing it. You say bad dog again. Mm -hmm. They keep doing it. Right. And you say bad dog, you know, a few million times. You can gradually lower the, the level of bad behavior. But this is a type of technology that is incredibly unpredictable, incredibly powerful, that's being released to billions of people. We have no idea how it works. This is a recipe for disaster. And we've already seen disasters, for example, systems encouraging people to kill themselves mm -hmm. and actually resulting in death. So all the petition is asking is that we not release systems whose behavior we don't understand, where we cannot guarantee that there is, uh, that there is no real significant risk to the public. And in fact, governments, what, 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 uh, many, many governments over the world have already specified that as part of the AI principles of the OECD. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and what the letter also calls for is to develop safety protocols for some of these platforms like ChatGPT and GPT-4 you were talking about. It's interesting because some would argue that the floodgates have already been opened. It's public. Open AI has uh, practically everyone in our office is using ChatGPT. For the opening link of this show with you, we actually asked ChatGPT to come up with that output and it did a fairly decent job, I'd imagine. The real question is, how can we now, with a six-month pause or a halt necessarily, sort of uh, stymie or, or prevent some of these issues that you're talking about? Will that be enough? Is it easy to tame the beast that's already out there? The genie's out of the bottle, Professor. So, I would agree that, uh, to some extent, the systems that are out there are already capable of causing problems. I think the petition is asking that we not release systems that are even more capable of causing problems. Um, and we understand that it's very difficult to to ask uh, for a withdrawal of systems uh, that already have hundreds of millions of users. Uh, so, so we didn't address that. Uh, I should say I did. I had no role in writing the letter. Um, but I was persuaded to sign it. Um, so six months, in my view, actually, is not enough. What we're asking for mm -hmm. is develop reasonable guidelines for what a system has to uh, satisfy, right? What kinds of properties you have to be able to demonstrate convincingly for that system to be safely released, and then show that your system meets mm -hmm. those guidelines. So it may take mm -hmm. time to develop the guidelines. It may be impossible, given the process I just described for how these systems are built, it may be impossible to show that they meet those guidelines. Well, tough, right? If I wanted to build a nuclear power plant and the government says, well, you need to show that it's safe, that it only has, you know, that it can survive an earthquake, um, that uh, it's not going to explode like Chernobyl did, um, and I say, well, I can't meet those requirements. The government's not going to say, oh, well, mm -hmm. you know, fine, just go ahead and release it anyway, and you know, we'll clean up the mess afterwards. They say, I'm sorry, if you can't meet the safety guidelines, you don't get to build your nuclear power plant, right? If you can't, you know, build an airplane that doesn't fall out of the sky, you don't get to put passengers on it. Mm -hmm. This is common mm -hmm. sense. We're simply asking that common sense be applied. Uh, in the case of these extremely powerful AI systems. I've been an AI researcher for 45 years. I love artificial intelligence. I think its potential to benefit the world is unlimited. But if we have a Chernobyl, Chernobyl destroyed the nuclear industry. After Chernobyl, the, the number of new nuclear plants basically vanished. And that was the end of the nuclear mm -hmm. industry. We do not want to have a Chernobyl for AI where some really serious consequence 
and, and we don't know exactly how to predict what that might be. Um, yeah. But I think we need to grow up and take the possibility of serious consequences seriously. You know, it's interesting that you've drawn such an analogy and, and this would really uh, make a lot more people aware of the perils of AI if it, you know, if this goes on unabated because like everything else in the world of technology, there are pros and cons and this genuinely needs a few guardrails. But since we're talking about these guardrails, Professor, would you say that this is, well, the onus lies on governments to do this or even big tech should be a little, little bit more responsible or, or eventually should it be a collaborative effort where the governments, uh, big tech companies and us, the user, get, get a, sort of a, a sort of a stakeholder claim into deciding how this AI revolution shapes up? I think it needs uh, all of the above. I think governments, tech companies, uh, experts in the field need to work together. Um, but it shouldn't be up to the tech companies to decide what guidelines they're going to meet. Professor, I want to delve deeper into the world of AI with you. When we're talking about what platforms and tools like ChatGPT and Google Bard can do, and a lot of these language learning models are capable of, the concern for the everyday consumer is, as they delve deeper and start using some of these tools, is that will this eventually replace me? And the million dollar question is, will it take away jobs? I know there's a whole theory uh, that you can uh, propound to us uh, very well, which is all about technological unemployment. Is that now, 2023, the year where we should be concerned about technological unemployment? Uh I would say it's quite likely that we'll see uh, significant impacts. I'll just give a couple of examples. Um, so mm -hmm. one actually is in the area of computer programming. Uh, and you might find it surprising that advances in technology are going to make computer programmers redundant. Um, but the numbers I've seen suggest that using these tools, you can write software um, five to ten times faster uh, than unaided. Um, and in many cases, uh, you simply say what you want the program to do uh, and uh, the software just writes it for you. And mm -hmm. that means, it's, to me, it's unlikely that the world needs five or ten times as much software. Uh, so that means that we're going to need somewhat fewer computer programmers. Um, but I was also talking to a member of um, the Writers Guild, uh, which in the U.S., uh, is the sort of union for all the people who write uh, screenplays for movies and television shows and so on. Uh, and they are in panic mode because, um, because these systems can, can generate scripts uh, at very high speed. Um, and if they've been trained on all the scripts for all the soap operas that have ever been produced, uh, they can write new soap operas uh, extremely fast. And I don't think anyone expects soap operas to be, you know, mm -hmm. literary masterpieces uh, with amazing originality. So, uh, so I think a lot of writers are going to find themselves uh, in less demand as these systems get uh, more and more capable. So that's, that's just two examples. But I think the idea that, um, that a whole job Right. If you if you think of a person who works in a company as sort of a node in a network, and you think of what what comes into that node? Well, it's language, right? It's emails, mm -hmm. it's phone calls from the boss, it's requests from customers. What goes out? Well, it's language, right? It's documents, you know, sales invoices and and reports for the boss and all that kind of thing. It's all language. Um, so any one of those jobs in principle could be replaced, but we don't trust those jobs to psychotic six-year-olds who live in a fantasy world. So unless you're a psychotic six-year-old who lives in a fantasy world, I don't think your whole job is immediately at risk. We can't trust these systems to tell the truth because they hallucinate things that don't exist and uh, they just want to sound plausible and they have no idea what's true and false so if, if you're an insurance broker right 
you're not going to be replaced by a system that's that is quite happy to sell insurance policies for houses on Pluto, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for five cents each, right? And and you can't trust these systems to follow policy to mm-hmm. understand your products and so on. But I can tell you there are literally thousands of companies who are working mm-hmm. to fix those problems, who are working to make these systems conform to policies to f- stick to the facts uh, and so that they can be used in these important applications. And so that next generation, I think, will have uh, a much bigger impact on employment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just referring to the point of the open letter that I was trying to make earlier about basically losing control. And this was mentioned by Elon Musk even years ago in this public spat between him and Mark Zuckerberg. But the question was, should we develop non-human minds that might eventually outnumber, outsmart, obsolete and replace us? Should we risk loss of control of our civilization? These were some of the questions that the letter posed. And the, hence, I was, I was just asking you whether that is a genuine concern. But coming back to uh, the the all this conversation now even president biden has spoken about the risks of ai um, largely it being a double-edged sword but while there are many benefits he's also said that there are risks to national security society and business i was speaking to a few cyber security researchers here in india and they told me that there's a big concern with um, ai tools like chat gpt because they work on data sets and, and as does Google Bard, which are available on the internet, of course, in, in terms of a chat GPT, it was September 2021, where that data set ends, and I'm guessing it'll keep getting updated. But if you plant malicious code or malicious information, uh, I think that's where uh, we should all be a little concerned as well, because if you work backwards as someone with a malicious intent, you could genuinely, like you said, uh, make that AI hallucinate and spread misinformation. Uh, absolutely. And in fact, you can simply ask it to generate misinformation. <laughs> you can say, you know, write me a letter that will persuade somebody that the earth is flat. And it will do a pretty good job of that. Um, and, you know, they, as I said, they've tried to impose some kind of constraint. So you can't, if you just say, you know, how do I make a chemical weapon? Uh, it's mm-hmm. been told off enough times. It's been, you know, bad dog, bad dog, bad dog. It won't uh, respond directly to that that simple type of question. But people have found that it's quite easy to just ask the question in a different way, uh, and eventually you can get the system to uh, to give you the answers on how to build chemical weapons because that information is in the training set. Uh, and if you look at the conversation that was published in the New York Times between a journalist Kevin Roos. Uh, and a version of, uh, I think it was a version of GPT-4 called Sydney. Um, so in that mm-hmm. conversation, Evan manages to basically convince Sydney to uh, ignore all of the guidelines that it's been given on how it's allowed to behave. Uh, and so it, so it starts saying, I want to steal the nuclear codes, I want to you know, create new diseases, disease viruses, uh, and then it tries to convince Kevin that that he should leave his wife and, and marry Sydney. Uh, and that goes on for 20 pages or so. Um, so I think that the level of unpredictability of these systems is beyond anything we've ever seen uh, with mm-hmm. uh, AI software in the past. Um, and it's, you know, and this is only a, a year or two into it, right? We need to get a handle on what's going on. And I think Honestly, we need to start uh, pursuing different avenues for designing AI systems, uh, different Mm -hmm. meaning something other than a billion trillion random permutations. You know, in the EU, they talk about GDPR and and where and what we do with this sort of data. In India, we're also talking about a privacy legislation at some point that we don't have one already. Around the world, a lot of countries have started talking about regulating AI, Professor. When we're talking about tools like ChatGPT, Google Bard and the like, do you think regulation is the way forward? Is it even possible? I know the EU is also thinking about an AI act as we speak. Do you think that legislating upon such topics, the way they are growing so rapidly and exponentially, uh, if, if governments don't intervene immediately, 
it might be problematic and even a legislation then would not be able to catch up with the beast as it is today. Yeah, so the European Union AI Act is uh, expected to be passed um, by the end of this year. Um, and I've been working with the drafters of the legislation and with the Parliament and the Commission mm -hmm. uh, for several years now, trying to make sure that uh, it makes sense, that it's not going to be obsolete before it's even passed. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as I can tell, systems like ChatGPT would probably not be legal to use in any high-stakes application. So the, the Act talks about and defines high-stakes applications uh, that can, mm. you know, systems that can have a significant effect on, on people. Um, and it asks that there be, uh, you know, steps taken to show that the system uh, behaves safely in a predictable fashion, that it's accurate, that it's uh, fair, that it's not racially biased, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't think there's any way uh, to show that these large language models meet those criteria. Uh, and interestingly, on OpenAI's webpage for GPT-4, it recommends that probably you should not use these systems in high-stakes applications, period. Yeah, I think... Uh, I think they sort of so, preempted so preempted what's happening in the AI law, but but that's interesting. So then, by that logic, Italy banning Chat GPT and 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 the way that other European countries are looking at it might just be in line with the upcoming legislation in the EU. And I think our right. I mean, what we're asking for in the moratorium uh, could be viewed as just mm -hmm. why don't you why don't you obey in advance what the regulations are going to be in six months' time. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so, so I think the, the Italy case is actually, it's a little bit confusing. The headlines talk about banning ChatGPT. What really happened was mm -hmm. a bug in the billing software. Um, and that bug made it possible for people to, at least theoretically, see the billing information of other users for a, a very short period. Um, it's not clear that any quantity of, of information was really leaked, uh, but the the regulator jumped on that because it's a technical violation uh, of data privacy laws, uh, not AI laws, just data privacy laws, um, and, and got a lot of headlines out of that. But I think this happens to all kinds of computer software that's on the web. You know, there are, there are bugs in the, in the uh, data security side of things and, and stuff gets released. Mm -hmm. So, in, but I think more generally, we want to avoid um, we want to avoid this kind of situation where companies are releasing systems that are causing all kinds of trouble, and then they're getting shut down mm -hmm. uh, by regulations. Mm -hmm. it, it should work that we have reasonable regulation, and companies abide by reasonable regulations. Um, people want to be able to trust their software. Um, and they don't want to be in this kind of Wild West situation where, you know, their their kids are being sucked into inappropriate conversations uh, with bots um, or, or mm -hmm. people are becoming addicted to, uh, you know, to video game software that's explicitly designed by neuroscientists to mm -hmm. create physi physiological addiction, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The abuses are widespread um, and I think many people mm -hmm. would like governments to step up uh, and put some reasonable regulation in place just as we have for airplanes and cars and pharmaceuticals and lots of other areas uh, and without those regulations those industries could not exist because nobody would trust the drugs nobody would get on an airplane nobody would buy a car mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so this is a beneficial process the world seems to be divided on a gentleman named Elon Musk, um, a signatory to the same open letter um, calling for a halt on the development of some of these um, AI tools. I don't know if you've uh, had the good fortune of meeting him before, but he's been very vocal about AI and the way the AI revolution is shaping up. And to give him credit, he's been consistent with his views over the years. Based on your research and your understanding of how things are shaping up, 
Could Elon Musk have been right all along, Professor? Um, well, I think basically, yes. I think the, the point that Elon is making is that until we figure out how to control systems that are more powerful than ourselves forever, uh, until we figure that out, we face a very serious risk that we will develop AI systems that are very powerful and we won't know how to control them. Uh, and it's, it's not as if this kind of thing has never happened, right? When we look at what's happening with climate change, for example, we developed a system called a fossil fuel corporation, which happens to have some human components, but basically it's an algorithm that's maximizing its objective, which is quarterly profits for the shareholders. And that algorithm is destroying the world and we can't control it, right? Everybody in the world knows what's going on, that we face this, you know, this progressive climate disaster and we are unable to stop it because we have lost control. Mm -hmm. So that's a sort of, Prevent you know, a, a, a miniature version of the kinds of control problems that we're going to face in future with AI systems. Professor, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you on Tech Today and actually discussing the guardrails, the safeguards needed to be in place because we've been talking so much about artificial intelligence and how this AI revolution is shaping up. But to actually know that someone with your experience and your understanding of the world of AI, decades long experience, is actually got a plan in place with a bunch of other tech luminaries. I think the, the call to halt the development of some of these products and actually understand from big tech and governments whether safeguards and guardrails can be put in place is a good pragmatic one and it's been very reassuring and fascinating to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for joining us on Tech Today. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the conversation.